This is ContactTalkRadio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on TuneIn.com, Ying.fm, and Upsnap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. Welcome to What the Health, an independent approach to your health span. Have you noticed how our health care system may not have your best interest in mind? Join Dr. Eckel in this fun and sometimes disturbing exploration of the state of healthcare and what it means for you. Now, here's your host, Dr. Eckel. Welcome back, everybody. This is What the Health, and I am Dr. Greg Eckel coming at you here on the Contact Talk Radio. Um, my exciting guest today is Dan Goodnow and author of Breaking Alzheimer's, hot off the press. And I, my staff have been sick of me talking about plasmalogens to patients over the last month. And I want to give you a little bit of background because I, um, I am so psyched for this gentleman on the show, Dr. Goodnow's research into the biochemical mechanisms of disease started in 1990. Uh, his curiosity about biochemistry of life is as insatiable today as it was 30 years ago. In those 30 years, Dr. Goodnow invented and developed advanced diagnostic and bioinformatic technologies designed and manufactured novel and natural biochemical precursors and identified biochemical prodromes of numerous diseases, including Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, stroke, autism, ALS, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, and cancers of the colon, the pancreas, the ovary, the breast, the lung, kidney, liver, stomach, and others. Uh, and he is just getting warmed up. He's going beyond disease and detection of the biochemical dysfunctions uh, to diagnose and, and the correction of biochemical dysfunctions to treat disease. Uh, Dr. Goodnow, welcome to What the Health. Thank you so much, Greg. Happy to be here. Happy to talk about some of the exciting things happening. I'm here in Denver, so the connection is not absolutely perfect. I'm in my hotel room. We're, we're presenting the first ever inhuman trials of plasmalogen replacement therapy um, in people with cognitive impairment. So it was embargoed as of yesterday. So your viewers are getting the very, very, very first public announcements of this. Work. Hot off the presses. So yeah. what is the, what what conference are you at and what exactly are you presenting? So this is the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. It's held every year. So it's in person now, in person and virtual. So people are actually moving around, which is a good thing to see. Yes. And it's nice to actually have human interaction again. Um, and so the, this is held every year. It was actually originally been, going to be in London, but it's now here in Denver. And um, basically it's an international conference of everyone from around the world on their Alzheimer's research. And so We've done a lot of work epidemiologically in Alzheimer's with the Russian University cohort in Chicago, as well as other aspects of Alzheimer's disease, you know, patented extensively on that. And so, yeah, that's so where we're going to present work that we just did in the clinical trial in Santa Monica. We have probably a thousand people using plasmalogen supplements now. Um, it's only been available for a little over a year. And yeah. this is a subset of individuals. We looked in much more detail, pharmacokinetics and so on um, of to like, so Maybe I should back up to one little bit because I know your intro was awesome. Well, just tell me, tell me. I know that intro was okay, awesome. Okay. okay. You are awesome. So, well, it's hard to even imagine someone doing that much work, right? Okay. So, yes. so let me give you the highlights of the Alzheimer's conference presentation. Then I'll kind of give a bit of background of how I got here. Okay? Yes. I went from the, the dark side to hopefully the light eventually. And so the, so plasmalogens are a critical component of your, of the human body. And I tell people there's really two real base level issues of human existence. One is our ability to convert hydrocarbons into energy, our mitochondrial oxidative stress, electron management. Like it's actual, we're, we're, a, we're a physiochemical being in that sense. And that's one of the core aspects of energy utilization that we've, we don't manage properly as we get older. And the second one is membrane lipid infrastructure because what makes us structurally viable and not a bowl of soup is that we have biological membranes. So the trillions of cells of the human body are individually comprised and separated from each other by biological membranes. So everything that goes in your cell or out of your cell, everything that goes in and out of the organelles within your cell are all controlled by this lipid matrix. So the, the human body lives in a lipid matrix. 
and that's where all the proteins in, are involved. So this lipid composition, as it changes, it changes how things work. It's a difference between walking on solid pavement versus walking in the mud. Okay, like when you're walking in the mud, you don't walk the same way. You can't walk as fast, you can't, everything is a problem. And so the same thing, so membranes are like that. And so as the membranes change, our function of the human body changes. Plasmalogens are a critical component of those membranes. And they're not a small amount. We're talking 20 to 30% of the lips of your brain, like very large levels, your heart, your lungs, your kidney, the retina of your eye have very, very high levels of these plasmalogens. And we don't get them from our diet. We have to make them ourselves. So unlike most of the fossil lipids that we can, or all the building blocks of the body, our dietary consumption can compensate. But what makes plasmalogens special is that their last step in their manufacture of the body makes them exquisitely sensitive acids. So they, they neutralize your peroxides and, and hydrogen peroxide and, and other free radicals in your body. And they are involved in neurotransmitter release of, of you know, vesicular release of neurotransmitters in the synapses. They're important for your, the white matter protection of your neurons, like the axon sheets are all high levels of plasmalogens in them. So what happens as we get older or with certain diseases when we're younger, our ability to manufacture as many plasmalogens as our body needs. So we, we make a lot of them, but we actually use a lot of them in daily activity. And so there's a basic, just a mathematical balance of how much am I making versus how much am I using? And, and if, you're if you're making less than what you're using, eventually you, draw, you drain your reserves. So you have this, basically you bleed out plasmalogens. They come out of your brain, your brain shrinks, comes out of your muscles, you're, you get sarcopenia, you, you're, if your white matter degenerates, you get you know, multiple sclerosis, ALS, you know, and those type of things. So the trick was understanding that we have this huge amount of epidemiological data, tens of thousands of people, age, disease related um, associations, right? Like these low levels of plasmalogens are, are really bad news. They're, they are predictive of all cause mortality, predictive of becoming demented. Um, they're low in certain cancers. So it's a, it's a really significant health consequence of having low plasmalogens, period. And so the trick was, how do you restore them? And so I'm a synthetic chemist as well as my PhD is in psychiatric medicine, is that I design precursors. So they're biochemical precursors. They're actual endogenous molecules. They're, they're, they're an intermediate in your own biochemical process. And so it's basically it's like building a partially built house where you just have to put the final pieces together. So I basically, the plasmalogen is manufactured, it's hundred percent vegan. We get omega-3 from our, um, an LJ source and we get the omega-9, which is for the, for white matter from a uh, plant source. And we design a molecule a couple of steps up the side chain so that it's completely natural. So it can be a grass molecule. So you don't need a prescription. It can be completely over the counter dietary supplement. Because I originally patented a whole bunch of, of um, supplements that were medicinal chemistry tricks to get, a, to get patents on them. And that's when I was first focusing just on Alzheimer's disease because the big thing was Alzheimer's with these plasmalogens. And so since plasmalogens are a natural molecule, can't patent them. So as a chemist, I said, okay, how do I make a patentable molecule for a plasmalogen? And so I, I basically did some medicinal chemi chemistry tricks and created kind of pseudo non-natural plasmalogens that would, that would break into natural plasmalogens once you ate them. So they become um, uh, patent protected. But as they got more and more diseases under my belt on these things, the, the realization that, you know, this is, this is a nightmare um, from a regulatory perspective because there's gonna be so much off-label usage of these molecules and there's no way of controlling it. And I don't, really don't wanna to go to jail for off-label you know, marketing with molecules. So let's just go to a completely natural um, grass-based molecule. We just, obviously we design it so that it's in high potency and properly manufactured. So anyway, so that's what we have. So we've studied this in animals and cell cultures and preclinical work. These precursors completely prevent demyelination. Like if we want to demyelinate an animal model, complete protection of demyelination. So complete that would be multiple sclerosis for correct. our our listeners out there. Yeah, so the myelin is the protective sheath. It's like the coating of your copper wire, for example, um, in your wiring of your house. And then the neurons is like the, the light switch 
at the end where you're turning things on and off. So yeah, so that, that, that protective coating in multiple sclerosis starts getting degenerated through inflammation and uh, there are high levels of plasmalogens in them. So animal models that we use, we, you know, Cooper's own is a, as a, a neuro, uh, demyelinating agent. And so we treat animals with plasmalogen precursors um, either before or after we can prevent demyelination. And then actually we can actually induce remyelination even while we have the demyelinating toxin. So it can actually basically um, give the body enough strength in the presence of a demyelinating toxin to not only maintain myelination, but actually improve it. So it's very, very powerful stuff. And then in, Alzheim in neurodegeneration, we use Parkinson's as a model. So you had a lot of experience in that from what you've read and worked on and written on. But uh, one of the models that we use for Parkinson's is a neurotoxin called MPTP. It was discovered by some kids in California that were trying to make designer heroin back in the 80s. And when they made their designer heroin, they didn't do such a good job in their bathtub um, you know, chemistry lab. And so they ended up creating this toxin called MPTP. And they gave a bunch of people Parkinson's, like these 20 year olds are going into the hospital with full blown Parkinsonian symptoms. And so there was a bit of a detective story to find out what was given these young kids uh, uh, Parkinson's and they found it was this MPTB molecule. So ever since then, we've used this to look at dopaminergic neuron degeneration in Parkinson's. Point of the story is if you give the animals plasmalogens, um, these particular precursors, you completely prevent um, neurodegeneration. It completely preserves 100% preservation of dopaminergic neurons. Um, period. So we've done all this work. Okay. And so then we've, you know, obviously we have the supplement available. And so we want to have to do, cause I'm a scientist and we do the scientific analysis work, which is why I still go to these kind of conferences um, in that we did an escalating dose study in California. Everyone was diagnosed with dementia to begin with. Okay. And they use the clinical dementia rating scale. So a CDR scale and the CDR scale has basically five levels. It has zero, which is cognitively normal, 0 0.5, which is mild to moderate or even MCI, like mild cognitive impairment. Yeah. And then level one, which is mild dementia, level two, which is moderate and level three, which is severe. So we had a mix. We had about four people that had pretty severe uh, CDR2, and some of them actually were kind of toggling between a two and a three, and some were at a one, and then a bunch were at 0.5. And so we didn't do any pre-selection of the patient. So we didn't say, okay, did you have a pre-existing low-level plasmalogen or not? No, we just completely ran them off the street, individuals, as long as they had a caregiver and they could follow the, the plan, um, they were included. And so first of all, we did an escalating dose. So plasmalogens, you have, like I said, you have a lot of them. So you have to make sure that you're not you know, putting a dropper of fuel in a, in a semi truck trailer and expecting to drive across the country with it. Right. So if you, you have, is a physical amount in the human body that we need to actually have, you know, do the math and figure out how much do I actually need to give somebody to modify their plasmalogen levels. So the first dose was at 900 milligrams, which is like one mil. So like a, like a dropper, like a, like an eighth of a teaspoon type thing. And then for one month, and then the second month they went to double that. So two mils which is 1800 milligrams for people that look at their DHA supplement type of things. And then we did that for two months. And then on the, the next month we did it, we doubled it again to four mils. And so we 3,600 milligrams, because that's the density of it. And it's just a liquid formulation. And then we did a one month washout and we measured how the blood, how the treatment modified their blood levels of plasmalogens. And we found there was a dose dependent effect that with each increasing dose, the level of plasmalogens were increasing in the blood. So we knew we were bioavailable. It was doing exactly, the target molecule was delivering what it was expecting to deliver. Remember, this was not designed for treatment, this trial. This was totally just pharmacokinetics, understanding the molecule, does it work? What kind of, is it, is it, sure. is it getting in or, you know, do we have the right dose? Sure. All that kind of stuff. Going right. yeah. And so two mils per day, basically elevated, great. And then four mils was just a little bit more. And what's important is people that had a pre-existing deficiency of plasmalogens, they disproportionately benefited. So if you had a low level to begin with, your levels increased the most because you were restoring a deficiency. But people that had high levels to begin with, they also got an elevation. And so then we said, okay, then we actually looked at cognition, like with the cognitive testing, every month people were measured for cognition. 
We're also looking at their mobility. So there's a little simple mobility test called the sit stand test, which is basically you sit in a chair and a guy there looks at you with a stopwatch and says, okay, stand up and sit down as many times as you can in 30 seconds. And I'm gonna count how many times you do that. And that's a measurement of your muscular strength. And, and so we found out that, so first of all, of, there's only four people that had late stage Alzheimer's, stage two. Three of those four people improved an entire CDR score within wow. three months. Like we're not talking about, like for people that are new to this, Alzheimer's disease is a disease where nobody says there's a cure because that's not, that's, that's not possible. So what we do is all these trials and all these drugs, all they're doing is trying to say, how can I reduce the decline rate? Okay, no right. one even talks about improving cognition. They're just saying, okay, here's the traditional decline that will occur over time. And can I make that decline less? So what we're seeing here is not, a, we didn't see a reduction in decline. We actually saw improvement in cognition. Okay, and then in half of the people with the mild or moderate CDR1, half of those improved an entire CDR score in the four month trial period. Wow. So that's pretty amazing. So in the, and in the, in the, the lower people that had mild, um, I think four or five improved few, it, it's a little more noisy for a period of time for that people. Again, that wasn't even the purpose of the damn trial. Okay, it wasn't even, it was just, we were just, just because we we're gonna obviously do this stuff, right? Yeah. And then what was also amazing is that of the 22 patients, I think it was, I don't have the numbers right in front of me. I think it was 14 or 16 improved by two sit stands. So wow. their, their muscularity, their strength improved dramatically. Like their, their mobility was improved over the four month period. And again, that was total randomness. So that's the part on, on so that was one part saying, not only okay, we can deliver the plasmalgia, and of the individuals that improved, I think it was 12 that had a full CDR score. I think six of them were in the high plasmalogens to start with and six were in the low. So there was no correlation. So the improvement in cognition did not seem to be related to their pre-existing deficiency or not. And that leads to our, we have a challenge in medicine with longevity because we, we do cross-sectional analysis and we think that these are static points in time, right? And so, so for example, brain volume, for example. And so we say, okay, we take a 175 year olds and we're gonna measure their brain volume. And we're gonna say, okay, what's the predictability of death or disease in the future for the people that have small brain volumes at age 75 versus people that have large brain volumes at age 75? Well, that's a false argument because what you're really measuring, because all of them had normal brain volumes when they're 50. And so, so the question is, is a 75 year old who has smaller brain volume has a faster rate of brain decline. So you're actually not measuring brain volume. You're actually measuring what happened to them in the last 15, 20 years that they've had a more excel. And so that's kind of one of the issues we have with medicine is that we think that we take these, we draw these lines in the sand and think that the world starts where we draw the line, but the world didn't start when we drew the line, the world started earlier than that. So anyways, for that, so then we did a bunch of, so there's a second presentation that deals with the biochemical effects. So plasmalogens have this antioxidant, they neutralize um, peroxides. And one of the biomarkers of lipid peroxidation, which is, that's what causes inflammation, if your readers don't know. Yeah. Um, I'll tell, I can speak a little bit about that in a second. Yeah. But when you have oxidative stress, the, well, I was just, so all oxidative stress in the body comes from mitochondrial dysfunction one way or another. So when we burn energy, okay, your car engine takes car hydrocarbons and burns it directly into carbon dioxide and water. It's a chemical combustion process. We do the exact same thing. So the human body is essentially an electric car. We use a, it's a hydro, hybrid electric car. We burn hydrocarbons and we use that energy from burning hydrocarbons to charge a battery. And the battery charge is called the electron, electron transport chain, okay? And it basically, it's a battery. It's like a, just like a lead battery, except instead of using lead, it uses protons, but it's, it's basically a battery. And that battery runs a pump called the ATP pump. And that's how we survive, that's life. And, but we separate it into sparks. Like one part makes carbon dioxide, one part neutralizes the water. And if it doesn't do that properly for, you know, you don't have enough, you know, N-acetylcysteine or, 
you know, your B vitamins or what, however many, there's a hundred different reasons that you could have mitochondrial failure. Anyways, these electrons skip out and your body starts spitting them out. The cells start spitting them out. And that's the first time that we can tell that something's wrong with the cell. And eventually if that doesn't get neutralized, it on the outside of the cell gets peroxidated. And that is what the signals the surrounding world that there's something wrong. I tell people the cells of your body is like your neighborhood, right? Like you really don't know what's going on in your neighbor's house, right? Until a chair comes flying out a window and lands on the front. <laughs> exactly, and, right, and you don't want to, right? You're hoping everything is just fine over there. And, um, but then a chair comes flying out a window and lands on the front lawn. Well, now something's happening over there. So all of a sudden, someone's gonna call 911 and all of a sudden the police come and the ambulances come and something's happening over there. And that's what happens in the human body. So the chair that comes out of a cell is this electrons and peroxidation. So plasmalogens neutralize those things. Mm. They basically prevent that from happening. And one of the ways, one of the biomarkers that you can measure is called malondialdehyde. It's a molecule that is a biomarker of, of membrane peroxidation. So we measured that and we showed that there was a very, very potent, very, very powerful correlation as plasmalogen levels increased malondialdehyde levels decreased. So it had a very powerful antioxidant effect. And then when we reduced the malondialdehyde levels, um, showing that it had a, so we were dealing with a real biochemical effect happening here, the catalase activity increased. So catalase is another really important antioxidant enzyme that your body uses, and it goes down when you get older. It's a very highly regulated um, or highly studied decreased catalase activity with age is a very, very well-established um, phenomenon. So anyway, so that increased catalase, basically we reduced the load of catalase. So the catalase was able to recover itself and same thing with superoxide dismutase. So we have very clear chemical effects occurring. So the, so that's, so that's, those are the two big presentations. Those are we're... the two, I, you know, I am, um, I, that is like groundbreaking right there. And I want to unpack some of this for folks because I'm with you. You're like, oh, we, we're starting here at the, like the punchline. But I wanted to start with the punchline because those, one, I was really excited to hear what you just presented on because that was under wraps until yeah. yesterday. But two, that helps set the stage. So when I went to school, I graduated medical school in 2001. I did not learn about plasmalogens. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm an expert in biochemical disease. Like my PhD is actually in biochemical mechanisms of psychiatric disease. And <laughs> right. I didn't know what plasmalogens were either until I found them on the mass spectrometer being decreased in Alzheimer's disease. So yeah, yeah, it was one of those really, it's one of those things that you just can't unknow. And you get a little annoyed, like why? Because we how know did how- nobody see that? That was well, 2005 is when you discovered that? Yeah, and so, yes. yeah. And so the big problem is that we've known that they're, they're, they're so obligate to life. Like if you're born with plasmalogen mutations, like you can't make plasmalogens, yeah. you're, you die. You basically, the mortality is, it's, it's obligate to human life. And so we have all these young diseases and proximal biogenesis diseases, and there's some others like X-linked ALD that have these proxosomal defects that affect some plasmalogen activity, but some proximal activity. And we know for a fact, we've been studying them for tens of, you know, 50 years. Yeah. But this idea of this plasmalogen deficiency later in life was a different situation. So like, you know, obviously when you're getting Alzheimer's and you're getting Parkinson's and we're, we're you know, you know, having other age-related declines like sarcopenia, these aren't inborn areas of metabolism, right? These are, we're acquiring this dysfunction. This is something that has, that was at one point working normally and is now not working normally. So you discussed the plasmalogen is part of and makes up the phospholipid bilayer, which is the cell wall of every cell of our body, right? Correct. And what, so what are the things that cause it to decline? Is, it, is there an environmental toxicity component to this? I saw that there's a, there's a glycerol piece and this is getting a little technical folks, but I do, I want you to have an understanding here because this is really groundbreaking research and really where, where the clinical trials go in with people. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of hope for folks with Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, all of these neurodegenerative states that uh, Dr. Goodnow has been studying, I've been studying in the clinical realm. And uh, so this is a, really a huge piece of the puzzle. When I heard about it, I mean, the, the hair stood on my arms of like, holy cow, thank you for asking kind of the right questions of like, well, 
you know, this isn't like just getting old, like Alzheimer's. I love how you wrote about that in your book as well. And I'm going to have that in the show notes for people to get because you really did a great service in writing it in plain English. And then you gave us a, a more detailed kind of like what we're doing here in the interview of we've got the plain English and then we have a little bit more for the nuances for the practitioners and providers that are watching exactly. the show. Too, and get the high know. level stuff. Um, yeah. And so you can dig into the details, especially with people, the APOE4 genotype. I really spent yeah. some time really describing that because there's a lot of, of misinformation on APOE4. Look, we've known about APOE4 for a long time. Okay, It was studied in cardiovascular disease and other diseases since the 60s. Okay, It wasn't until the early 90s that, we, that it was associated with Alzheimer's disease. So we actually knew a lot about APOE4 long before it was associated with Alzheimer's. And so, yeah, so the, the, the APOE4 thing, I go into a little bit detail because people think it's confusing. Um, it's always a challenge to come back to the causation of a disease. Because when you find someone with symptoms, they, you know, they have secondary effects, tertiary effects, quaternary effects, like the, the cascade of complexities that symptomology can occur from a, a single event is quite diverse, right? Like, you, you know, you, you take a hundred people with, with, type two diabetes, you're gonna get a very diverse symptomology distribution of those individuals. We still can't totally predict who will have renal failure, who will have liver failure, who will have cardiovascular disease, which, which ones will get, you know, go blind. And so, you, and, and, we, and which, one ha, which, which people have diabetes and have no symptoms forever. Like for some reason they can just survive diabetes, right? right? right. And so, so we know that the diversity of symptomology um, can be quite broad from a single um, dysfunctional event. And that's always becomes a challenge when we deal with these diseases that come to us and we say, okay, where, what's a symptom and what's a cause, right? And um, Alzheimer's is probably one of the worst in that area because we, um, because it's fun to study the tau protein and the amyloid protein and study all the, biochemistry and this protein and that protein and this enzyme and that enzyme and here's a biochemical here's a test for that and here's a test for that and and right. it drive, drives you crazy because it's there is a huge amount of information right we don't, we're not lacking information we're lacking integration and we're lacking um understanding where these where these things are coming from so yeah. that's where i've come into it over the time and um like my background is in so many large clinical trials like we talk about cancer I got two big studies coming out of Japan right now in breast cancer before and after surgical removal of breast tumors and looking at the biochemical effects of that with plasmalogens and mm. you know, fatty acid elongations. So these diseases, this biochemical basis of disease is a very important thing. And people need to be unafraid. Your biochemistry is you, it's personal. Um, you actually can change it, okay? You know, we are biochemical. Okay, like what comes in comes out, like what we feed ourselves. Um, we can measure a lot of things and we can modify a lot of things, but the, people have a lot of control over their health, their metabolic health and controlling the metabolic health can have dramatic long-term benefits, both and also negative consequences if they're handled the wrong way. You so. are sounding like a naturopathic physician there, sir. Well, see, so when I first invented, it's like my first real foray into this and my background is in biochemical mechanisms and then mass spectrometry developing tools, right? So part of it on the Huckleberry book is saying, you know, sometimes you have to stop and make a tool. Like if you want to measure the stars, someone has to make a telescope. And so, so I had to basically make that telescope. And part of that was making this, you know, ion cyclotron mass spectrometry system that allowed me to measure thousands and thousands of biomarkers in a blood sample or in, you know, I did all this functional medicine for genomics research as well back in the day. And that was great. This was like, wow, what a candy store for a scientist to play in. And so, and, and so I started doing all these large clinical trials. We did 6,000 person colonoscopy trial, did 9,000 people longitudinally in Chicago for Alzheimer's disease, very large studies, thousands and thousands of people in colon, pancreatic, you know, ovarian cancer stuff. And so the point of the matter is, is that the biochemistry of the body is reflective of a disease state. So, and it just makes sense, right? If you see someone with ovarian cancer, okay, and their sister does not have ovarian cancer, clearly there's something different between those two people. And just because you can't measure it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means you're not measuring the right stuff. Because if I can physically see a difference, right. 
there is a difference. And so you're just not looking hard enough. And so this tool basically allowed me to do that. And it was a massively successful, like virtually every human disease can be diagnosed. And it was like, that's what I was doing. I was right, patent after patent for diagnosis of autism and multiple sclerosis and these cancers that you're talking about. But as all this data started coming in, instead of getting more complex, it started getting more simple because these, there's too many overlaps between different disease states, okay? Um, virtually all cancers, for example, have low plasmalogens as well, okay? And it's related to the cancer cells inability to go into a fasting state. And that's what causes, um, causes a risk for cancer then ultimately causes a trigger, like the BRCA gene for breast cancer. Fundamentally that mutated protein is related to the, it, reduce, it reduces the ability of a cell to use fatty acid energy and then it becomes sugar dependent. And then once it becomes sugar dependent and if it's sugar dependent long enough and the right conditions arise, it becomes cancerous. And that's why people with the, women with the BRCA gene have a higher incidence rate of cancer, but they don't have a higher mortality rate. Okay, so the mortality of a woman with BRCA gene it, with the breast cancer mortality is exactly the same as anyone who gets breast cancer. So the, geno the genotype can provide risk, but it gives you the risk of the disease and the disease itself translates into your mortality and lack of functionality. So that's when this stuff started, this integrated medicine really came in to play because um, it became clear these prodromes. See, the biggest thing, the biggest eye opener for me was two colon cancer studies we did in Japan. Did one in Osaka, where we looked at, this is early in when I was doing these biomarkers, we had these biomarkers for colon cancer, blood tests, and it's actually available in Japan right now as a blood test. So you can screen for people for high risk colon cancer. And these, mole, these gut microbiome molecules go down in people with colon cancer. And I thought, oh, this is great. So we're gonna look at people before colon cancer, do surgical removal, measure the blood samples after, and we're gonna see these blood markers come back to normal because obviously the tumor is consuming these biomarkers. Did that study, no change. So after surgery, the biomarkers were just as low as before surgery. And this is a long time after surgery. It wasn't like two days after, it was like 12 to 16 weeks after. So they were fully recovered. And so I didn't believe it. So we did another study in, um, in Chiba, Japan. So you know, a few hundred miles to the North and um, got exactly the same results. So it was, became clear that these biochemical changes were occurring before the disease. So these were prodromes. So the low GTAs in this particular situation with colon cancer was identifying people at risk of colon cancer. And then once they had colon cancer, they all had two problems. They had the risk mm -hmm. and now they had the active disease process. And this also explained why people who have cancer and they get treated for cancer they have a higher risk of cancer recurrence than someone who's never ever had cancer before in their life. And so, so these are the things that started coming together. Yeah. And then, you also, and then ultimately you end up with a problem where it's not my job scenario, right? You have all these scientists that, you know, it's, it's, it's glamorous to write these papers and invent things and, and, it's, it's, and you're insulated from real people because I'm dealing with numbers. I'm dealing with 10,000 people each patient has a number and they have an age and they have a gender and they have, you know, sure. they're, 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 they're a compilation of numbers, right? And you're Final insulated. Identifiers. Sure. Exactly. And, and that's, and you have to do that for statistical yeah. analysis, right? Like you can't like, obviously that's, but then you start realizing when you try to implement this stuff into routine medical care, and then you start realizing, you know, there's some serious implementation barriers. <laughs> Um, in, in getting some of the stuff into regular people. Um, yeah. Infrastructural, our academia, um, there's, there's a separation between those doing research, and a lot of that research is very good, but then translating it and implementing it. And so at some point I said, you know what, this is my job, okay? If no one else, I, I have to do, like, I, I can't just sit here and continue to write papers and patents and this yeah. and that. And just um, watch it, especially with these findings. Uh, you know, I used to, I ha had seven physicians on staff here and it was like the joke of like, go to the conference. They'd come back with the research of, we got to put this in on our patients and we put it in on the patients and it would be like crickets, nothing happened. Kind of similar to your J J yeah. Japanese studies. 
And, you know, so I like to, I'm full on aligned with your mission on helping to get this implemented and actualized in, in practice, because we're talking about people's lives, right? They're not yeah. products. These are our aunts and our uncles and our mothers and our fathers and our brothers and our sisters. So that's exactly why I created this platform, uh, Doc. And, and I'm so excited. And to have regular it. people just don't get it. They yeah. just don't understand. How is it possible that we can have all the technology of our iPhones and our tablets and the technology of our cars and you know, we've got Musk and Bezos moving, going to the moon on their own rocket ships now. Like, how is it that we can do this? Yeah. And we have done nothing human health wise. Okay. Yeah. All cause mortality is going up. Like our lifespan is decreasing. People are living longer with these chronic diseases. Um, we're not, we haven't, we've, we've done virtually nothing other yeah. than nutritional benefits. And in fact, some of the links to benefits epidemiologically has nothing to do with our health systems it has to do with individuals taking more responsibility we have yeah. more people now taking just general b vitamins okay back in the 80s and 90s less than half of people over 70 took any vitamins at all right and now it's 80 to 90 percent of like, it's hard to find an elderly person who doesn't take at least a b vitamin or something yeah right? right and so these are things that in some of those aspects show up in the data sets mm. but anyway so the point of that whole story is that um yeah so community implementation people are hungry for this they don't get it they don't understand it and and they're constantly bombarded with with details that you know if you want the details you can have the details but people yeah. want just tell me the story tell me what's going on here like and how, how do i do with it like and a lot of these things are actually fairly easily explained and so i spend a lot of time now doing that and talking to real people, it's been an interesting scenario. So the community trial involvement, we'll be launching large community-based trials um, where people themselves are engaged and we'll do the scientific side of things and we'll continue to look at the objective endpoints. Um, and, but that's kind of, I think where the world is gonna go and, and you know, the natural path- that's gonna expedite, yeah, that will expedite the, the research to implementation. Like it has to for research. I mean, we've got it, it's kind of old school in the towers and in those silos that all of the researchers are talking, but it's rare that it gets out actually into clinical practice and moves the needle in the real world where we really want it to. I, and, and bless the researchers, like I will take clinical, you know, I will take the research and we want to use that. Like we need that because yeah. it helps us understand, well, where, how do we go to the front of the line to use what's working? It has the best likelihood of working, uh, which is awesome. So on that level, I mean, I, I held this up beforehand. So I, I've kind of got turned on yeah. to your world, which is your biomarkers. Um, I mean, it, this is one of the most comprehensive blood works that I've seen. And that's kind of how, you, when you said you were correlating you know, what kind of popped up were these 200 biomarkers that really seem to make a difference in the world, in the real world and actually clinically. Um, so I'm really excited to be kind of part of the- Well, of that's, the yeah. So the proton scan is basically the biochemical starter kit. Okay? okay, like I've measured probably half a million molecules in blood. Okay, that's how, like the human blood <laughs> is very complex. complex. Yeah. But it's, they're not random they're organized. And so that organization makes it much less complicated. So Protom scan includes basically the short list of here are the top 10, 50, whatever it is, but they're organized in such a way that there, there are certain biomarkers that we should be measuring. We just don't. Phosphatidylcholine. So there's a section on fossil lipids, not just plasmalogens, but other fossil lipids. Phosphatidylcholine. Virtually all the pancreatic cancers and liver diseases in the world come in people with choline deficiencies. Okay. It's one of the most undiagnosed health, negative health molecule possible. And it's linked to low levels of cholesterol. Okay. We have this obsession with getting people's cholesterol levels low. When in fact, we have 164 country data sets. Okay. 12 million in some of them, just in one country alone, showing the optimal blood cholesterol level somewhere between 220 and 250. Okay. Okay. That's Okay, and, and basically, as soon as your blood cholesterol level gets under 200, your risk for mortality starts skyrocketing. 
Okay. And that, just for the record, so that is what the regulations, when I started practice, it was 220 as the upper limit of, of a reference range. And with the advent of stat medications for our listeners and viewers, below 200 is now the cutoff marker in conventional medicine land where you're going to basically be put on a stat medication or cholesterol lowering medication. So what you're hearing here is around the globe when you really look at health, uh, we're looking at 220 to 250 on a cholesterol front. So sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to get yeah, that. And it's, even, and it's worse the younger you are. Okay. And so you get a population survival bias. So the young people that have low cholesterol die at a disproportionately high rate versus even old. And so by the time they get older, a lot of those young people with low cholesterol are dead. And so they don't show up in the data sets later on. So you have these survival biases. That's another problem that we have with science is that we go, oh, you know, average 95 year old is 35% dementia. But that's in the people who survived the last 25 years, right? And so you have, you know, the, the, the full prevalence or the penetration of dementia in mid nineties is over around 80%. It's mm -hmm. only about 20% that don't get dementia if you live long enough, if you, if you, if wow. you combine them all up, right? And yeah. so, so the, the issue really isn't who gets dementia is why do some people don't <laughs> really in, in right. terms of, uh, and what's different about them? Why do, how do I emulate the non-dementia population? and not try to just avoid the, the, the dementia population. But yeah, so those are the things that, so Proton scan has fossil lipids because the choline deficiencies is something that people just don't measure. We look very carefully at the fossil lipid uh, fatty acid ratios. So people that have omega-3 deficiencies, especially arachidonic acid and your dietary fatty acid profile, make sure that's, and that's easily fixable. Choline deficiencies are easily fixable. Take some lecithin for crying out loud. And so and then iron is another one that we keep, I keep an eye on because iron deficiencies are a big, big problem. People like simple little iron test, not a fancy one. This is just simple, total iron. But like when people get hospitalized for infections and even the COVID, most of those mortalities occur in people with low, low iron when they get admitted. See, iron is really critical for all your mitochondrial biochemical functions. So when you get inflamed, okay, your body makes a whole bunch of new cells it's making macrophages and T cells and microglia are inflamed. And all these new immune cells that your body makes, those immune cells need iron. And so they end up sucking iron, your available iron out. And so you, if you don't have, you know, decent iron levels, like we think about it for oxygen utilization, but it's, it's a critical component and kind of where iron goes, other things go like your copper and selenium and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So deal with that. My, uh, methyl transferase is a real critical system. People talk about homocysteine, right? And they look at homocysteine, like they, B12 and B6 and folate. People hear about that kind of stuff. Methyl transferase is really critical. Tau formation in the brain is, is methyl transferase deficiencies. Um, amyloid is actually methyl transferase and plasmalogen deficiencies in the brain. This is actually done. These are studies. This is not just fantasy. These are, these, this data exists. Like you, you put an animal on a, on a homocysteine elevating diet where you basically starve them with your excess methionine or, or folate deficiency, and they start getting neurofibular tangles in the brain because that's how tau is formed. So I, I'm actually a whole new series is coming out in the next few weeks I'll be releasing that goes through the Alzheimer's pathologies in much greater detail um, so people can understand that. So methyl transferase is important, but we, Nowadays, people take a lot of vitamins. So sometimes you can trick the homocysteine test. So it measures sphingomyelins and ceramides, a couple other things that really indicate whether or not you have membrane degradation, choline deficiencies, and so on and so forth. And again, some of that's fixable with simple little creatinine or creatine supplementation to help methyltransferase or choline supplementation. So that's one aspect. I do a simple mitochondrial blood test, um, just measures elongation. Um, it's a, it's a, it's the world's simplest meth mitochondrial test. It doesn't tell you why it just tells you, Hey, something's not working. Yeah. You know, adrenal, like we look at methyl trans, um, methylation, uh, um, uh, fatty acid elongation process. And if that's turned on, that means that your mitochondria aren't consuming. It's a uh, fatty acids, very simple, simple, simple things like carnitine, N-acetylcysteine, alpha lipoic acid, some of those things will totally fix that kind of aspect. And we look at peroxisomal function. People, don't, 
people don't know what peroxisomes, but it's yeah. actually part of your lives. When you exercise, you're stimulating your peroxisomes. When you go on a keto diet, you're stimulating your peroxisomes. When you're fasting, you're stimulating peroxisomes. So peroxisomes and your mitochondria, peroxisomes are kind of like your garbage disposal or it's your, if you remember the Back to the Future movies is your flux capacitor type cell. <laughs> yes. Like it, it takes garbage and it generates good stuff from garbage is what your peroxisomes do. And they're inducible from energy and, and so on. And so we want to make sure, and that's where your plasmalogens come from. And that will determine, they, they balance the mitochondria and the peroxisomes are balanced with each other. And if one's out of balance, so multiple sclerosis and autism, what happens in those situations is the mitochondria is impaired and it can't do its job. So the peroxisomes try to pick up slack. So all the energy is supposed to, the mitochondria is supposed to do gets shoveled into the peroxisome and we get these pro-inflammatory, very long chain fatty acids and it causes those, those symptomologies. And likewise, the reverse occurs when your peroxisomes are, are impaired or say if you don't properly fast, if you're on a, if you're, if you're on a high glycemic diet, um, you, you don't let your cells turn into fatty acid metabolism, then you start losing plasmalogens and your triglycerides will go up, right? So your blood, so simple stuff, like your, your fasting triglycerides should never be over hundred. And if they're over hundred, there's a couple things wrong. And um, so we measure that and look at cholesterol, very simple, just your total LDL and HDL, because that tells you 99% of what you need to know. And if you need to go into deeper details, there's obviously deeper tests to go for. And then simple creatinine, uric acid. I um, mean, the elderly, we get obsessed with kidney renal function. And we think that, you know, we're all, all we're focused on is whether or not they have kidney failure. But the bigger problem is actually low creatinine and that's muscle wasting. So a lot of elderly people come in with a creatinine of like 0.6 or something. And that's basically muscle wasting. And so these are, and same thing with uric acid. A lot of these biomarkers have these U-shaped curves. And there's, a, there's an area that they're supposed to be in. High is bad, low is bad. We focus on just the high as being bad, like high uric acid for gout, for example. Right. But low uric acid is present in Parkinson's and MS and other neurological viral infection diseases. So this simple blood test, it's in little sections. And um, it's kind of like, it's designed to be kind of one big view. Like you can just kind of, once, once a doctor gets used to looking at it, instantly you can say okay here are two things that are not right what what is it behind the scenes that is consistent with these two things being wrong yeah. so for example if i see someone with a cholesterol level of 150 and then their phosphatidylcholine levels are at the 10th percentile then immediately i know they have low cholesterol because they can't make ldl because your body requires phosphatidylcholine to make ldl cholesterol you fix the lecithin you fix the cholesterol. And so these are simple things. So same thing with L HDL and peroxisomal function. So these are very, very simple things. And one of the challenges really has been business, really. It's a, it's a monetary issue, right? You know, these, 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 these highly studied, designed biochemical intermediates. Okay, we're not dealing with plant extracts, like, you know, some of the only one that I really work with, and there is good ones out there. So I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing plant extracts just for what I do is biochemical engineering. And there's just the curcumin, the curcuminoids are one that I do deal with, with the GTAs, these, these molecules that are related to colon cancer and pancreatic cancer, because that's gut microbiome. And there's certain plant molecules that are mimetics that'll actually have the same biological activity. So back to this thing. So you fix the phosphocholine, you fix the cholesterol levels and so on. So that's kind of what the, so back to the monetization thing though, is that the issue is that, you know, creatinine or creatine like muscle build, you know, you've been using it for your whole life. It comes in a bucket for five bucks. Like you can't, like you can't make money selling creatine. Okay. Period. And acetyl L-carnitine for, for mitochondrial function and acetylcysteine. You know, these are, you know, your basic um, metals, like if you have to get copper or selenium, like these things have been around forever. Okay, they've, they've been in a competitive marketplace. So the price point for all of these things are well established. And yeah, so okay. different supplement manufacturers will try to create a little gimmick here and there. They'll blend this with this. They'll try to create separate little blends to differentiate themselves from each other, which is all fine. Okay, like it's a free world out there to do the things that you need sure. to do. But the challenge really is how do you implement this integrated medicine into a clinical trial program. See, that was the other big problem I had with all my patents 
is that if you go through the typical FDA process, okay, if I wanted, if I want to design a plasmalogen precursor as a drug, say L-DOPA for um, Parkinson's, for example, okay, so L-DOPA is a biochemical precursor of dopamine. It's, it's basically a grass molecule, like it's, it's a biochemical intermediate. And it basically, it's two steps, I can't remember exactly how many steps up, it's side chain for dopamine. So you take L-DOPA and it converts it to dopamine and you get reversal of symptoms in, do, in Parkinson's um, for that period of time. But that's a single agent treatment, right? So you can't, so if I wanna go through a clinical trial for Alzheimer's, okay, I'm gonna have an agent, which is the plasmalogen. I'll do my pharmacokinetics, but I just finished talking to you about, okay, so I have to pick my dose, I have to pick exactly how I'm going to run it. And then I'm going to run my trials. And then um, I'm going to have a label that says, okay, I validated this particular dose under these particular conditions. And this is my legally processed label that I can use. And I yeah, can't, yeah, claim. can't right. I claim, I can't, I can't, I can't spread from that. And so it becomes very difficult. So if you want to have n cysteine or current, these other things with it, those all become independent measures. It becomes, makes a trial almost impossible to obtain. Sure. And so, and then obviously if you want to start, if you find it uses in multiple sclerosis, you have to run a whole different clinical trial um, process. So anyways, so what I've, the, the, the way around that is to make no claims. Okay, so from our perspective as a manufacturer and as a scientist, okay, the plasma allergen precursor is a natural molecule. It's a, you know, we, 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 we synthesize it under GMP conditions, but sure. fundamentally it occurs in nature. So it's not a patented molecule itself. You know, obviously we have some trade secrets and how we make things and sure. there's a, you know, a fair bit of stuff in there. There's special but, sauce. We got gotcha. you. Yeah, but well, it's, <laughs> it's pretty important stuff. So yeah, so, so it, yes. now we can run these adaptive trials. We can do protocols. We can still do all the science of the world, but we say, look, we're not here to treat Alzheimer's. This supplement, elevates blood plasma allergens. Okay. That's it. That's, we're not making, you know, you as a doctor or you as a patient. Okay. Yeah. These are the clinical trial data that we have. This is the stuff that we're doing, but fundamentally we're not in the business of treating disease. Okay. Yeah. We're in the business of providing metabolic support, um, re restoring dysfunction in systems, mitochondrial function and so on and so forth. Cause these things transgress trans they go across many, many different diseases. Sure. Same thing with the proton scan test. It's designed where people get compared to a reference population, but it's, it's the most, it's the most narcissistic blood test you'll ever get. Cause it's all about you. And yes. if you want to know about yourself, this is what it's about. It's about you and your blood and how your systems are comparing with each other. Okay. And it's about not saying here's a cutoff. If you're yeah. below this cutoff, you have this disease. If you're above this cutoff, you don't. So it's not about diagnosing anything. It's about understanding what is the optimal operational system of your, of your, of your engine. Okay, and say, okay, how do I supplement the right, you know, natural supplement here and there to get these things? Because this is where it's supposed to be. I don't care if you have multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's. It doesn't matter what disease you have. This is what your cholesterol should be. This is what your triglycerides should be. This is what your plasma allergens should be. It doesn't matter what disease you have. Okay, this is like, if you want to, and if you want to get into more fancy stuff, you want to do exosomes and stem cells and other stuff. But get this basic operation condition working first. Because if, if these are the systems of your body that we've known for 50, 100 years, it should be, we know where they're supposed to be, okay? And so it's like, before you fix the windshield wipers on your car, let's get the engine and the brakes working, okay? And so that's kind of where we're about. And so that's kind of how now from a clinical trial perspective, we run these large epidemiological science-based, like we'll run the MRI, we'll do the objective analysis, we'll do all the studies, we'll do all the, the, the outcome analyses, yeah, but they're done for a different purpose. They're actually now done with the end user in mind, the consumer. They they themselves can now look at that and take evaluation, and the consumer can be the actual patient, and or the natural the natural yeah. med doctor taking it to the people. I love that. So in and, the in the closing minute, what do you what do you got? So it's it's this is doable. Okay, yes. these are things, and and it makes sense. Like people, there's things that people understand. Why does exercise work? How do I know it's working? Okay. Why does this work? How do I know it's working? Like people understand certain things, but they don't, no one's giving them the feedback loop to reinforce that. Yeah. And the other problem too with decline is that 
we remember ourselves being healthy. And so teaching, showing people like with video or with audio, like your voice changes when you get better, okay? And so people need to see themselves get better, okay? Because it's about not just me as a doctor, you as a doctor saying, yeah. oh, I looked at your chart, okay? I know you don't feel better, but you're better. Just trust me because <laughs> right. I, did your, I did your cognitive test a year ago no. and now you're better. Yeah. Don't tell me you're not feeling better. I'll tell you you're feeling better. So no, so it's the other, so we have to put this on, they have to be able to see this themselves and their, and their caregivers have to be engaged in it. And that's kind of what I've been spending my passion on. I love it. A couple of years. Dr. Good now. This is the book, Breaking Alzheimer's. I've got the link in the show notes to go out and get it. It's really well written, folks, uh, for just lay public. If you don't have a scientific background, it's in there. If you have a science background, all of the research is in here, all of the data. It goes in depth. His resources online are amazing. If you all got something out of this show, this is hot off the press, modern day research. Uh, I love also that you write around the scientific um, thought process throughout your whole book as well. That is such a service to people to understand scientific thinking. Um, this is What the Health. If you like the show, share it with two people. This is a game changer for all neurodegeneration, cancers, et cetera. So um, make sure you get out, read this, share this show. This is a big news. This I'm super excited to share this one with you all. If you like the show, give us a five-star review out there on your favorite podcast platform. This is What the Health, Dr. Greg Eckel on the Contact Talk Radio Tuesdays from 2 to 3 Pacific Standard Time. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure.